Well, good afternoon from the uh, Delaware shore, uh, United States of America. Uh, as you recognize me from the uh, intro there, I am Frank Rendito, and I don't usually host uh, these digital dialogues. But a funny thing happened along the way over the last couple of months. I was uh, introduced to this book called The Technology Fallacy, and uh, I was encouraged to read it, and so I did. And I was amazed at how it resonated with me and what we're doing here at the Institute and our readiness framework. So I said, we should do a digital dialogue on this thing. And so uh, three of the four authors have graciously uh, agreed to come on and discuss the book. So I don't want to take up any more of that time, uh, of, of your time with talking about uh, that. Let's go ahead and bring them on. Uh, first, I'd like to bring on Ann Phillips. Ann, thank you for joining us. Please uh, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. Hi, Frank. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, so I currently lead the research and insights for our Deloitte's Global CEO Program. Uh, and this is where we support our client CEOs throughout their entire leadership life cycle. Um, my research in the past has been focused on digital transformation uh, with an emphasis on culture as well as digital leadership. Um, and prior to that, I was a management consultant. And I'm calling you today from Atlanta. Atlanta, hot Atlanta, as I've been known to uh, I've been known to call that place. So excellent. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you. Next, I'd like to bring on Gerald Kane. Jerry. Please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, sir. Hi, Frank. It's uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I am actually a full-time academic. I am the head of the Management Information Systems Department at the University of Georgia's Terry College of Business. I've been here for about two years. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was at Boston College for 15. Um, and while I was in Boston, had affiliations with MIT Sloan Management Review, um, which is how this book came to be, as well mm -hmm. as a visiting faculty at Harvard Business School. Um, so I really look at how uh, legacy companies are struggling to adapt to a digital world um, mm -hmm. and have been studying that for about uh, 10 years now, as well as um, ethics of artificial intelligence. It's sort of the, the new thing that I am exploring uh, in my side time. Wow, the ethics of artificial intelligence. I think... Uh... I think I could ask you to do a whole digital dialogue on that one. That, uh, you could. That's <laughs> an amazing uh, topic. You're nearing the end of the semester, I guess. So this must be. Yes, thank God. You, right. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, finally, Jonathan Kapolsky. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Uh, how about uh, a little bit about yourself, sir? Yes. Hi, Frank. And thanks for having the three of us with you today. So I am calling you or calling into the show from Evanston, Illinois, which is the home of Northwestern University. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of the faculty and at Northwestern, I teach courses on branding and digital disruption and technology for mm -hmm. marketing applications. Uh, this is an encore career for me. And I spent 20 years of my life as a senior partner at Deloitte for among other okay. things, an opportunity to work with Ann and Jerry on both of the books that we did together that were published by MIT Press. I was, yeah, I was, when you mentioned Deloitte, I was going to ask you if you and Ann overlapped there for a period of time. So I guess the answer is yes. Close collaborators. <laughs> Close collaborators. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you all for being here. And I know uh, just to give our audience uh, a, a little bit of a, a background, we, we discussed, uh, you know, what we're going to discuss on on the show. And I'm just going to I'm, I'm going to pitch uh, a question and then you all are free to interrupt each other and uh, and get get into it. Uh, our producer just posted, uh, you know, ask your comments or questions in the LinkedIn chat. Feel free to do that as we go along. We'll address them uh, as time and opportunity permit. So I'm going to throw something out there for you. Um, one of the first things I, I saw in... Uh, in the technology fallacy uh, was a, a concept called traits required by the digital leader. And I know here at the Institute, we've, we've discussed that. I think I even had a survey instrument about that out there a, a few years ago, but uh, I'd like to talk about that a, a little bit. So 
Um, I'm, I'm throwing it out there. What, what, uh, what traits are important and why are they important? Well, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so we actually had an article based in the book called uh, in MIT Sloan Management Review, which of course, which was entitled how D digital leadership is in parentheses, isn't different. Um, mm -hmm. Because we I do think there's this belief that, um, you know, everything has changed as a result of digital technologies. And mm -hmm. some things have and some things haven't. And it's sometimes knowing the difference is really where the problem is. And when we surveyed folks about what were the most important characteristics of a digital leader, um, they were things like being change oriented. They were things like being forward looking. They were things, um, technology understanding was on that list, but it was number four. And when you look at what people responded, it was more about having a general sense of the trends um, mm -hmm. of digital technology. And so, um, I would argue it's hard to be forward looking um, if you don't understand the, those trends. And so um, I often say it's easier for me to teach the general manager the digital knowledge they need than it is to teach the tech pop people the, the managerial and strategic things that they need. So um, a lot about digital is different, but a lot of it's not. And managers just need to make sure they uh, keep their skill set and their their knowledge set up to date to be able to lead their organizations into this digital world. Yeah, Sarah, it's, go ahead on. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's interesting that you should say this because um, you know, focusing on CEO leadership and thinking about you know broader leadership in general, you're you're absolutely right when when we say that you know not much has changed in terms of leadership. A lot of the the traits that you listed around being change oriented, being forward looking. Leaders have always had to be that. Leaders have always had to look into the future and figure out where they're going to take their companies. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the big difference is technology is playing a bigger and bigger role now. So that fourth element of having to be te technologically savvy, I think, is only going to grow in terms of importance. And mm -hmm. a lot of leaders are recognizing that. They're recognizing that they have to learn about technology. Interesting. Interesting. Jonathan, you want to add anything to that? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but go ahead. No, no, happy to jump in. So agree with everything that Jerry and Ann said. The only thing I would add was what came up repeatedly when we talked to people about the difference between being in a digital environment versus sort of the business as usual environment was the speed of change and the, the pace of business. And what sort of emerged for me in a very strong way from all the research that we did. You know, there were 17,000 plus surveys, plus lots of in-depth interviews, was the need for experimentation. And the idea that people need to experiment, try some things out, learn some new value that new technologies can provide to them. And in many cases, what we heard was a disconnect between the leadership and organizations, which said, of course, we're experimental, we take risks, we reward risk-taking, and the people on the front lines who often said, not quite. The case. Not so much. <laughs> the leaders say they do, but the reality is, you know, we yeah. reward failure in our organization. And we had a debate internally as the author team about sort of some of the terms that are common parlance in Silicon Valley, fail fast, fail forward, and so forth. And we actually used a slightly different term because I do think that failures could be tainted in more what we'll call legacy organizations. And so we talked really about the idea of uh, testing fast, learning fast, and scaling fast. Okay. So which begs my question, I'm going to go off script a little bit because of our discussion. Uh, what was the disconnect then? And the, ma the management team says, we encourage failure, you know, we reward failure, experimentation, and the, the folks doing the work said, so, well, no, not so much. You know, I'm still looking over my shoulder in case anybody's, you know, because there's evaluation time, bonus time. So what was the disconnect and how to, clo how to close that? I'm sorry for going off script, but I, I just got curious. What's the disconnect? I mean, I think that this gets to the heart of uh, a true an organization's culture, if you want to go there right now. Right. Yes, uh, right. But but if you if you think about it, you know, the disconnect is between what people are feeling every day on a daily mm -hmm. basis and then what the leaders are saying. Right. So if your words don't match your actual actions when you're talking about rewards and mm -hmm. and behaviors, um, then it's it's not going to be real. Right. 
So if the leaders are saying that you can take risks and you can fail, um, but then come review time, you're punished for it. Um, that's a different story. So it's 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 a misalignment between what what people are saying against their values and then the unspoken rules of how things work in an organization. Um, right. And in order to have a proper culture, you need what you say to match the things that you do and the things that people believe. Yeah, interesting. I often say people ask me, so what is how do I change my culture? I said, you get the behavior you show. So if I want a certain behavior, I should be showing that. So, and I think the other dis the other disconnect I think is um, so often digital is just an add on to everything else people are doing. So yeah, go and experiment, but still you got to do your J job, and still you got to do perform. <laughs> so many people we talked to said, yeah, that's a great idea in theory. I just don't have the time for it. I mean, you hear all the time about Google's assume you know twenty percent time where they had you know, employees could experiment. It just never worked because nobody had um, extra time. And so they don't create right. the environmental uh, conditions for that experimentation to succeed. Yeah. You know, Frank, I was going to um, say one of the books that we referenced in both of the books that we worked together on was Mindset by Carol Dweck. And okay. Carol Dweck is an academic at Stanford psychologist. And she really talks about the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset and the growth mindset being that recognition that we need to learn expand acquire new sets of skills and expertise and so forth and mm -hmm. we quote in the second book the transformation myth that we worked on together an interview that the ceo of microsoft did with harvard business review and he had been uh introduced to the book by his wife and part of the reason why his wife shared the book with him they had a daughter with some learning disabilities and said you really need to read this book and in the interview, he said something which I've quoted many times, which is, you know, before I read the book, our focus on hiring people at Microsoft was people who were know-it-alls. He said, after I read the book, we focus on people who are learn-it-alls. And I thought that, you know, shift in his mindset from focusing on people who knew everything to people who could learn new things it was a fairly profound way to describe the difference between being in a business as usual for digital culture. That's, that's fascinating. I kind of triggered something. And I always look for it. I don't look for the A students. I look for the B students because the B students are, are used to failure and recovering from failure. That's, that's my mind. If you have an A student, they're used to success and maybe you get into the world and all of a sudden you're faced with a challenge that you've never, and you don't know how to handle it. So I like that that little uh, uh, little edge that a B student might have. So. Well, and Frank, just to kind of piggyback on this, a number of years ago, Teach for America did some research about mm -hmm. who were the successful teachers. Mm -hmm. And so, as you may know, Teach for America is a highly competitive uh, position to get. You know, as highly competitive as getting a position at a management consulting firm like Deloitte. And um, they looked at the people Same who were plug, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But, you know, often they would look for people and they'd look at their GPAs and the GPAs as an indicator. And what they realized after looking at many people over the years who had been really successful or not, they actually asked for their GPAs by year. And they discovered that the people who struggled as freshmen and sophomores, but did incredibly well as juniors and seniors were people who did exactly what you described, overcoming adversity, learning how to learn, becoming better learn-it-alls, and that those people actually tended to be better than people who you know, struggled for the entire four years, but even people who just you know got straight A's all along. Now, nothing wrong with straight A's, but this yeah. notion of overcoming adversity and learning how to learn you know, is very much sort of what we discovered as part of our research about corporate life and digital transformation. Yeah, well, Jonathan, a... you're making me feel better about my GPA now. So yeah. like, I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> I'm keeping yeah, this in mind as I'm watching my kids and their grades too. Yeah, yeah, because yes. as as a you see that argument didn't work for me when I graduated from college back whenever I graduated from college, I started out as like a C student. And by the time I was a senior, I was on the Dean's list and, and people would just look at the cumulative GPA and say, no, not good enough for law school. Go do something else. In any case, um, 
I'll throw you another curveball. So um, I don't know why I didn't think of this question before. So what is the technology fallacy? <laughs> now, why didn't I think of that question before? So what is the technology fallacy? You never so answer that in the book, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and the backstory is we had written the whole book and then we tried to come up with the title and that was the hardest part. Oh. And so Jonathan gets credit for the technology fallacy. He's the one uh, that came up with it. And we were like, oh, that's great. And we never explained it in the book. Um, so we, you may actually find that we have very different answers to this question. When I'm giving this, um, I refer to the technology fallacy as it's this mistaken belief that just because um, a company's problems or risks are caused by digital, that the solution involves digital as well. That sometimes the most important responses are organizational changes, our leadership changes, our talent changes. And your need to respond to the digital world doesn't, in fact, uh, involve technology, um, which is not what you hear from, no offense to my co-author, is not often what you hear from consulting firms these days who are selling services and want to do implementations. Um, you know, many of the things are, are, are much more fundamentally rooted in the DNA of the company. So that's mm -hmm. my definition. Uh, mm -hmm. Jonathan and An may have and, and very as a different. Former management consultant, Jerry, I, I will say that my answer is still similar to yours. So okay, whatever the consultant might say, yep. we're implementing technology. <laughs> Jonathan. Yeah, no, and I would agree with that as well. Uh, I mean, the profound difference between you know getting the right tools and being smart about what tools you pick. But more importantly, being smart about how you use the tools, and that very much ties to changes in people, changes in culture, changes in yeah. mindset, changes in processes, changes in organization. And often you see these situations where people have purchased a fancy new tool. I work a lot with marketing technology. The tool at the moment is a CDP or a customer data platform. And the record of unsuccessful implementations of that, unfortunately, are pretty high. And right. partly because people never really thought through those other factors, which are important, if not more important than the technology itself. And Jonathan, you bring up a really good point. Um, and it's this idea of, uh, you know, that we refer to in the book as duct tape, right? So the duct tape. And that was my next question. Okay. So you, go, ahead, go ahead and uh, segue right Frank, through it. Frank, this isn't your show anymore. Just give I'm up sorry, and recognize that. I'm going to go on yeah. mute. Go ahead on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as Jonathan was saying, it's, you know, it's not enough to just have a tool. Uh, I think a lot of people make the assumption that, oh, if they put a lot of investment into buying this tool, this technology, whatever it might it might be, um, then it's going to automatically bring them business advantage. And it's not like that. You have to figure out how to use the tool in a way that's going to bring your specific company um, advantage and and you know change the way your company works, change the way your your customers interact with you, uh, change what you bring to your customers. Um, so th the reason why we call it duct tape is you know there. What a thousand, five thousand, however many ways that you can use duct tape um, in any given scenario. I think if you Google it, you'll find uh, you know creative ways that I never would have thought to use duct tape. And technology is very similar in the sense that there is no guidebook for how to use a specific technology. If you look at AI today and Zen of AI, that is what people are trying to figure out. They're trying to figure out how to use it. And the more you actually try to figure out how to use it, and the more you play with it. Um, those capabilities that you discover are going to build on top of each other, and your knowledge of that tool is going to build on top of on top of each other. Yeah. Jerry, go go ahead. I or Jonathan, whoever wants to jump in. Yeah, there. No, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I got a duct tape story too, but go ahead. yeah, well, <laughs> I've got one as well. Uh, <laughs> so I, years ago, 2016, I had an opportunity to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, and it was a wonderful experience. I'd highly recommend to anybody. But I um, was on a flight a couple of weeks before, and I was talking to somebody, and they had climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. And I said, do you have any advice? He said, bring duct tape. <laughs> and I looked at him like, why would I bring duct tape? He said, just bring duct tape. You'll, don't worry. You'll find plenty of uses for it. And literally the first day that we were out, a guide comes running up, and he says, does anybody have duct tape? And I'm like, yeah, I've got the duct tape. And what happened was one of the tent poles holding up the cooking tent had bent over and they couldn't get it back together again. And he saved the day as a result of the duct tape I was able to share. 
So this notion of you know finding value in unexpected places from technologies is very much this you know experimentation, this discovery, and so forth. And Jerry introduced me to a term I'd never heard before, but I use frequently now, which is an academic term, affordances. The act of finding value in a technology tool that may not have been readily apparent and may not even have been the intention of the people who created the technology. And as Han said with generative AI, I see this all the time now with my students where they're coming up with ways to use generative AI that if somebody had told them all the things that you could use generative AI for, never mm -hmm. would even have appeared on that list of how you could use generative AI. So the notion of being playful, of experimentation, and so forth, is you know key to all of this. And you know, often in legacy organizations, we're so busy, you know, doing the stuff that we do to get the products out and make sure they're 100 percent high quality and so forth, that integrating that with the sense of playfulness and experimentation and so forth is difficult because that's not the culture that has been responsible for getting that organization to where it is today. All right. So finding a use for a, a tool that maybe at your disposal that didn't have, it wasn't its original intended purpose. And, you know, my duct tape story is in, a, in another life. Uh, I was, uh, I still am kind of a, a, a drummer and, and uh, played in a rock band for like 12 years. And whenever we go out on gigs, I never brought extra drum heads because sometimes you blow through a drum head when you're playing. I had duct tape. So if you put a crack in the drum head, you just put duct tape over the drum head and who knew? So the technology would be get another drum head, but the fix is this duct tape. So that, that's kind of, kind of interesting from uh, my, do you have a, a duct tape uh, uh, analogy there for us, Jerry? Uh, I don't well, no, because the duct tape mind. idea was mine. So I'm just pleased that everybody can uh, relate okay. to it all. And I would refer, refer you, if you haven't checked out, there's a great Wikipedia article on duct tape. And I learned a lot um, about oh, it. So, so uh, you duct taped the duct tape article. Absolutely. Excellent. I started digging excellent. into it. And that's what we found out. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, this isn't my show anymore. <laughs> so, um, in, in, at the institute, we we look upon digital transformation as uh, as a journey, uh, and so we never, not never, but we we kind of shy away from the terms digital maturity because uh, some people might think that of, of that as terminal value, like if I get to a place, but it's really an ongoing and continuous improvement and journey through digital transformation. But I know from looking at the book, you did pick the term or use the term digital maturity. And I'm gonna give you a chance to give me some context around that. So uh, I'll open it up to whoever wants to talk about that. Give me some context, go ahead. You know, we did do a little bit of um switching back and forth between uh, digital maturity and digital maturing. And once again, I'll credit oh, yeah. Jerry for this because you know the notion of digital maturing was exactly what you said, Frank. It's not an end state, but it's a process of continuing to adapt and change and evolve and grow you know, as new technologies come apart and you learn these new values, these new affordances that come with that technology. So our preferred term was digital and maturing versus digital maturity. But at times we did use maturity because that's often what we saw in you know, external articles and so forth. But right. what we have tried to talk about is this is not a one and done because the second book that we wrote was called The Transformation. And we wrote that in the middle of COVID. And the whole idea of the transformation myth, you know, we thought it was a clever kind of play on uh, the technology fallacy. Is it's a myth to think that you do a one and done kind of transformation. In fact, it's much more of a journey. So that was the intent. Was but we sometimes lapse into using maturity instead of maturing. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great distinction because uh, when you think of uh, maturity, you think of I, I think of the difference between terminal value and instrumental value, right? The terminal value is I've reached CMMI level three, right? And so I should be better, but you know, what's, what's really happening, but I like the digital maturing. Uh, 
Uh, and regardless, it's better than ahead. regardless, it's better than transformation because that's the <laughs> you know that's the term that comes up, and it's that mm -hmm. it's that one and done or oh, I'm transformed now. So um, whereas it is the ongoing, you know, if you're only going to stop transforming or maturing if you think digital technology is going to stop evolving, uh, and I haven't seen it in my lifetime, and I doubt I will, um, right. because I think we're going to continue to see innovations and organization and individuals and societies are going to have to continually adapt. And I think that's just the mindset that we have to shift into, that we need right. to keep maturing throughout our whole lives, which is exactly what we're talking about. Like, right. companies need to keep maturing. It's not just about finding this you know, happy medium of where you are now. It's a moving target. And unless you are along for the journey, um, you're going to get left behind. Right. Um, and it's not like project management. I mean, classic project management is one of the definitions is there's a definition of done and you're done. And, right. But this is not a this is not a project. This is a program, if if you will. So uh, interesting. I'm glad I'm glad we were able to uh, look, look at that, dig into that a little bit deeper. Um, so. Being a digital organization, I mean, we talk about that here at the, at the instant, a digital enterprise or a digital organization um, is really different, profoundly different from traditional business and, and, and customer models. So um, if you wouldn't mind describing this difference uh, between a digital enterprise or digital organization and traditional models, uh, that, that, would be, uh, that would be great for our audience. Uh, well, so, I mean, I, there are a lot of differences, but I think that we can start by talking about just culture in general. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll go back to that, that phrase. Um, one of the things that we found that separated, you know, digitally maturing organizations from other organizations is they had a very distinct culture. Um, so, you know, they were more agile. For example, they had a continuous learning mindset, what Jonathan was talking about in terms of the growth mindset. They mm -hmm. encouraged experimentation. They were much more collaborative. They worked across, um, you know, they didn't really have silos within the organization. So they worked more effectively across functionally. Um, they had a better risk appetite than other organizations. Um, so they operated very differently and they had a, a, a very different kind of mindset. Um, but not only that, but they were intentional about creating this kind of culture within their organization. Interesting. So would you say that the the gap that we talked about earlier, the gap between what management said they wanted and what actually happened on the shop floor, so to speak, was narrower or more in line? Is is that really the yes. one of the characteristics of a digital organization? Yes, because okay. they're very okay. intentional about making things that they say match up with what people actually believe. Um, and what's visible in the organization. Okay. Um, so they and made often, priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we often get asked whether digital maturity or digital transformation is a bottom-up or a top-down thing, and the answer is it's both. You have to have senior leadership with a vision for where that organization is going and mm -hmm. make sure everybody knows what that vision is going to be, but you can't just um, have them declare that this is what we're going to do and then expect everybody to follow in line because a lot of it's about figuring out how to how to do these things on the ground so it has to be this bottom up and top down at the same time mm -hmm. yeah frank one of the nuances that we saw with some of the companies that we explored in depth was that companies that were good at this tended to share a lot so if somebody ran an experiment in one part of the organization they shared it with other parts of the organization because they were very good and there was a quote from the former head of hp basically he said, you know, if I only knew what, everything that HP knew, you know, we'd be a much better company. A and um, this notion of, you know, how do we really share stuff across the organization, take advantage of it, but we don't all have to repeat the same experiments. But the nuance about that was not only did they share, but they shared things that didn't work as well as things that did work. And I was recently had a conversation with a senior executive at a company that I'm doing some advisory work for. And one of the things that she mentioned was that they do this monthly kind of sharing about things that they've worked in one part of the organization and so forth. And I asked her the question, do you ever do sessions where you talk about something that didn't work? Interesting. There was silence. And I, I suggested to her that, you know, those things could be very powerful too, because first of all, we'll tell people don't go down that path again. 
But it's exactly. also it also encourages people to recognize that sometimes it's okay to try something that doesn't work as long as you learn something from it and then you can leverage that learning into the next mile of experimentation that you do. Interesting. And your all your conversation here and responses uh, triggered a couple of things for me. And I hope I, uh, I, I hope I don't take too much time doing this. The, um, I'm hearing uh, what I try to teach people is vulnerability. In other words, hold yourself open to scorn and ridicule. Like I'll be, I'll, sh- I'll share it. It's it's not a problem, uh, and that's that's kind of what I call you know being vulnerable. And I think that's what helps a digital culture, and that's what triggered in my mind as you guys were talking. And the second thing is the scientific approach to failure, and that is. It's not necessarily failure. It's one more thing I know that doesn't work. And that is also very valuable. And that's kind of what I got out of your uh, mm-hmm. out of your uh, discussion there. Uh, well, we and we interviewed the head of Google News or something like that, yeah. a senior executive at Google who said, we're running thousands of experiments a day and we almost don't even care if they work. We just care if we learn. Um, yeah. And so that rapid experimentation and continual experimentation, I think, is sort of the hallmark of those that are um, really pushing the envelope. And in a digital environment with digital platforms, you can do those things because you now have the data to sort of be able to analyze it. Right. Kind of circles back to the learning organization that you alluded yes. to earlier. Jonathan, I'm sorry. I, I started. No, no, no. I, I was just going to want to go back and underscore your point about vulnerability. Mm-hmm. One of the things that we talked about is back in March 2020 when the pandemic hit. Uh, Arnie Sorensen, who's no longer alive, but was the CEO of Marriott, did a webinar for the entire organization. It was part of monthly kind of Arnie talking to his. A team. And the particular cause for it because of the pandemic was a decision to radically uh, downsize a lot of Marriott's operations. And he shows up on the video and he's being treated for cancer. So he's lost all of his hair because he's had uh, radiation therapy. And he just talks about the fact that the decision to downsize was something which he understood the impact of it and he understood that you know he had some responsibility for it in addition to these exogenous events of covid mm-hmm. but what he displays and you can see this thing on youtube this level of empathy and vulnerability which is rare to see with uh, a senior executive like that and i reference this multiple times it you know, probably runs about 15 minutes but I, i'd highly recommend if you want to see a real case somebody who was vulnerable who was being treated for cancer and had every reason not to spend the time doing this uh, i would highly recommend looking at this video yeah you just saw a comment uh, come up uh from one of our institute fellows so i'm going to uh ask her at our next institute fellows meeting to kind of uh give some insight to that but uh thank you very much any anybody else want to comment on that you're good all right Pregnant pause. So here's what we're going to do. I was very intrigued and I saw the strong coincidence or what have you between your digital DNA model. And I know from our notes, uh, Jerry, this is yours, right? The digital DNA. Um, So your diagram in the book shows something very much like uh, a human chromosome with a double helix. And there are 23 digital DNA, I'll call them chromosomes, if you will, mm-hmm. just to keep with the, uh, uh, the metaphor. So just an open-ended question. Talk about the digital DNA. Why 23? Was it a coincidence or a purpose? Did you back your way into it? Just open open the floor to you guys to talk about digital DNA because I found well, this fascinating. Yeah, I think it depends on who you ask. This was actually <laughs> um, the brainchild of our fourth co-author, um, who is unfortunately unable to be on the call with us today. Um, and he would claim that he just came up with the twenty three, and it just so happened magically to be twenty three that matched with DNA. I don't think anybody on the author team believes him. Um, And so, but it's a very 
helpful, you know, mechanism. So a lot of what he would do was go to organizations and ask them to sort of rate their organization on a one to four, one to five scale on these 23 items. And then which ones could we like would most move the needle if we could make some progress on these. Mm -hmm. And it's really a very pragmatic tool to then identify, okay, because you can't do digital transformation or digital maturity all at once. It's going to be an ongoing thing. The question is where to start. And it's a very practical tool on how do you start figuring out where to start as an organization? Um, and we really recommend sort of six to eight week initiatives um, where you're not taking, you know, a massive transformation all at once, but it's about little sprints that get you towards your goal bit by bit by bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I think digital DNA is a helpful tool because it helps you go in, figure out where you are, where you want to be, and where's the low hanging fruit that you can really focus on to make real progress. So I'll ask Jonathan and on to weigh in on this. What's, what's the most interesting thing that you've found from the research on uh, digital DNA? What the... Uh... What things, what may have surprised you, good or bad? What, uh, what do you think? I'm, yep. I'm, go I'm ahead. One of the, go ahead. Nope. <laughs> um, no, you I, go on. Go on. <laughs> I don't know that anything in particular surprised me because, I mean, this really fell in line with a lot of our research. And in fact, that's how we um, ended up connecting with Garth was because there was a lot of overlap in the in what he was studying in terms of uh you know, digital DNA and cultures of organization, mm -hmm. um, along with what we were studying. Um, but it, it, you know, to me, in, in terms of doing um, the research on digital DNA, they implemented this test or, or they had these um, measurements or metrics that they would give out to, to different companies um, to try to measure where they were along these 23 dimensions. Um, and, and I think probably the most interesting thing is how surprising uh, the results were for every organization um, in terms of we didn't know that that you know we had pockets that felt this way or, or that were at a lower level of maturity than we, than we mm -hmm. interesting interesting Jonathan you were gonna you and on were fighting over the response so go ahead <laughs> well I, two things one is you know just echo what on said which is you know, even in a, well, in a large organization, you can also see radical differences between different parts of the organization. Then just very maturing companies tend to be very good at taking the best of the best and you know, bring it together. So one of the elements that we talk about in both of the books is that notion of, you know, people working cross-functionally, cross division, right. or going from one another. And, you know, how do we pull the best of the best? And it goes back to the quote from Lou Platt, who was the CEO of HP about really leveraging the totality of all of HP. But the other thing I'd say, like any kind of DNA, we know that the resemblance between a gorilla or chimpanzee's DNA and a human DNA is actually pretty close. Yeah. So small changes that can make dramatic differences in how it manifests itself in an organization. And, and one of the takeaways, I think, from the work that we did for both of the books the technology fallacy and the transformation myth was, you know, sometimes you go to a seminar or you go to a training program, so I'm going to change everything. And it's yeah. consistent, you know, small changes exercise over time that produce dramatic results. And it's sticking right. with these things as opposed to like, you know, suddenly doing a 180 because those really work. And so the organizations with you know, the digital DNA, the organizations that were successful at transformation tended to be pretty good at being consistent over time. Mm -hmm. They suffered setbacks. Interesting. Yeah. So sort of the, the butterfly technique uh, yep. effect or you build a beach one grain of sand at a time. And just so our audience knows what I'm talking about here, there's the, the, the helix there, if you could yep. see it, but uh I thought it was really, really, uh, really, really cool because there's a, a big, there's a strong confluence with our readiness framework. That yeah. 
because that's what I, I really Now, what mean. I would say, because there is one thing I dislike about the digital DNA um, okay. framework, is I do think it has the runs the risk of people saying, oh, we're just not a digital company. It's not in our DNA. We can't make it work. And that going back to that sort of fixed mindset thing, and I hear that all the time. We're a legacy company. I'm not a digital person. That none of this is fixed. Every company can adapt to a digital world. Um, and that's where the growth mindset would come back in. So I really like the digital DNA, but I, I want to caution that, you know, nobody's d DNA is digital or not. We can, you know, everybody can do the work necessary. Yeah. Um, what what I got out of that was that uh, digital doesn't imply technology. And that's really part of the fallacy, right? Yes. So uh, great, great discussion. Uh, so uh, I'd like to get to a wrap up here. And uh, one of the wrap up questions I use is something uh, that I use in an interview technique. Um, and I'll go around the horn with each of you. What have each of you been dying to say that I haven't asked? So think about it for a second. And... Uh, if you if nobody wants to go first, I will make a call. As the good professor that I am, I will make a call. So what have you been dying to say, but just hasn't come up and you just want to throw out there as we wrap this show up? I'll throw one out. Um, and that is, you know, slightly different. And incidentally, and I, part of the reason Alan was probably laughing is that's what I use to wrap up all of my interviews as well. Oh, uh, and sometimes it's short and sometimes it leads to the most interesting stuff. Um right. I would then, so I've, I've taken, not critiques, um, but as I speak, people ask me like, okay, a lot of this data is three, four, five years old. Does it still apply today? And I say, absolutely, it still applies. It's sort of an evergreen thing. Um, but the thing I would be dying to say is artificial intelligence is not magic. Artificial intelligence is not fundamentally different than what we've been dealing with for the past 20, 30, 40 years. It is the next step in the journey. Um, but it um, it is a technology that's going to provide certain affordances that we figure out how, how to use and et cetera, et cetera. I think it's a major moment, um, but I think so many people just don't understand AI. They chalk it up you know, as magic and they don't seek to understand it. And so a lot of what I'm finding myself teaching about now is trying to demystify artificial intelligence and put it in this framework of ongoing digital transformation that... Um, it is this next step in the journey, and it's going to follow many of the same paths. It'd be somewhat different, but I think a lot of what we've already written about is going to apply as well. Excellent. So, uh, Jonathan, what uh, what nugget have you been dying to get out, but hasn't hasn't come up yet? So the the first book was published in 2019, Technology Fallacy, and then we published a second book, The Transformation Myth, in 2021. And Jerry will recall this back in March of 2020, we're having a conversation with the publisher and the editors at MIT uh, Press. Press. And uh, this was just as COVID was starting to emerge as a something that was gonna change the world. And um, we had this vision of a book and they said, well, like, what about this COVID thing? <laughs> and I can remember, both of us thinking, well, you know, it takes a while to get a book written and published and so forth. This COVID thing will be long done. Good guy. So, you know, we, we kind of, but we did pivot. And we pivoted and wrote the book and in record time and both, you know, the writing team as well as the publishing team did a, an extraordinary job of getting something out quickly. And it gets published in September 2021 and COVID is still with us. So, uh, you know, I always go to um, back to a quote that I love from Condoleezza Rice, who was the former secretary of state under the first George Bush. And she always said, you know, what at one time seemed impossible, in retrospect, seemed inevitable. And so we could look back, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, and we can see how things logically led to where we are today but sometimes it's very hard to predict where they'll be. And I, I think generative AI is a little bit of that. You know, a couple of years from now, we'll look back and say, well, of course, that was all sort of obvious. It all was logical and so forth. But we are at this moment of pivoting for lots of organizations. What will this have an impact for? And just in the same way, back in March 2020, 
who knew? Right. Who knew what the impact of COVID would be? But the gist of the second book was very much around this notion that people were able to do in days and weeks what used to take them months and years. Right. And uh, I'm seeing the same thing now with generative AI. It is forcing us to even increase more rapidly the level of change and the right. speed of change than anything I've seen 40 plus years of you know, working in and around technology. Yeah. Being able to see a paradigm shift or a significant event as it's happening is quite a talent as opposed to coming out of it and looking back and say, yeah, okay. And then maybe writing about it, right? Be, it being news as opposed to history. So that, that's a pretty cool observation. On bring us home. What nugget have you been dying to tell us, but hasn't just come up? Um, so I will say, you know, even though words matter, don't get caught up in the label of and terminology of things. Okay. Right. I mean, this concept of digital transformation, I think the word transformation has been used a lot in a lot of different ways. It's been used for many years. It's lost some of its potency, I think. Um, but it doesn't seem to the fact that we're talking about not something that is just small and minor. We're talking about something that's fundamental. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the idea that that you're going to be stuck on certain terminology like digital transformation or digital DNA, whatever you call it, everything that we've been writing about, everything that we've done in this research on digital transformation um, is very much relevant now. Um, yeah. You can call it, you know, AI. You can call it generative AI. It's still the idea that Jonathan talked about disruptions, you know, and, and Jerry talked about how this is applicable right now. Um, those are both true. The world is only getting more disruptive um, and it's not just technology, it's COVID, it's a lot of other things too. Right. Um, so the things that we talk about in the technology fallacy in terms of culture and transformation and the way organizations operate and the way leadership needs to change, it's all going to be true going forward. Um, yeah. so it's more relevant now than it might have even been in 2019. Yeah. If if everything is transfer, transformative, then nothing is transformative. If, if you devalue the whole term so much that uh, so we need to we need to pick those nuggets out. Great observation. And um, I, I do need to correct one thing. Uh, that last question is actually something I stole from our managing partner John Palinkas. Uh, but I do, uh, I have co-opted that and always ask that at the end of an interview or, or something like this. So I'd like to thank Jerry, Ann, Jonathan. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, thank you all out there who've been watching, listening, and posing comments and questions. Really do appreciate it. Uh, so thank you very much. And we hope to see you on the next Digital Dialogue. Ciao. Thank you for joining our Digital Dialogue. Be sure to join our next Digital Dialogue on the first and third Tuesdays of every month.